Welcome to the Pencil Bob channel. I hope you enjoy my stories. Please like and subscribe and hit that notification icon so you never miss out. Now on with the stories. Dog rules, ableism, and invasion of privacy. Hi guys, this is gonna be a long one. Sorry in advance for the wall of text and probably not so great writing and formatting, obligatory on mobile, and I'm tired and will probably sleep right after I post this. I just kind of need to vent and don't have many people to talk to about it in real life. I'll try and answer questions, make clarifications tomorrow if need be. A certain board member has been making a seemingly excessive amount of rules with little regard to the mental or physical well-being of disabled individuals in regards to dogs and dog ownership, and, in my opinion, pressured me into allowing him access to my home on a day that we did not agree to. There also seems to be instances of favoritism, exceptions for certain people when it comes to making and enforcing rules. A bit of context. I live in a condominium that was made with the intention of housing disabled adults, and oftentimes their caretakers, though if they are live-in staff they usually have a room in the owner's unit. If I remember correctly, it was built three to four years ago. The majority of the residents have a mental disability, and some have a combination of mental and physical. As far as I know, none of the residents here are physically disabled and neurotypical. I live in my own single bedroom unit. I'm a caretaker for my older brother who is autistic, as well as my neighbor who has Down syndrome. The building layout is three stories in a rectangular shape with a hole cut out of the middle, which forms the courtyard. So any given side of the building is basically unit hall unit courtyard, and all of the unit's doors are in the hallway. There are two main entrances. East is the front main door. West is the back main door. One entrance on the north and the south, and one in each of the corners. Every door can be accessed by the key fob given during the unit's purchase, but only the main doors have the option to use a code to get in. There's 80 or 90 some units, and the majority of them have been sold. There are less than 10 dogs living in the building. I've heard 5 or 7, but I don't know for sure, all of which weigh less than 20 pounds with the exception of one service dog. Onto what's happening. Before I moved in, I had heard about an incident where someone's dog was pooping inside. It hasn't happened ever since then, but I had heard about a rule being implemented, something to do with every dog being DNA tested, and I assumed that was the main reason. Fast forward to last month when the dogs were finally tested. One of the HOA, or COA I guess, everyone I've talked to just calls it the HOA, board members was there at the time, and he was saying things about rules that weren't even in writing yet, some of which seemed really weird. The main one was that dogs aren't allowed to relieve themselves on the east or west side of the building. When asked about where they're supposed to go, the board member said that owners need to take their dogs out behind the garages. The garages are on the south side of the building, which only has one paved path from the door to the road in front of the garages, and there is no sidewalk by the garages, as well as no wheelchair accessibility. One of the residents lives in the building with her elderly parents who care for her, and her dad is always in a scooter to get around. When asked about wheelchair scooter accessibility, the board member said that, as an exception, their dog can go on the north side of the building, which does have a sidewalk and accessibility. One accessibility concern that I don't know whether or not it's been brought up yet, is that whoever does snow removal in the winter does a super shitty job, to the point where my dad has come in after them to redo it for free with his own equipment. Another rule that was brought up with no official writing until later, is that no dogs are allowed in common areas, and can only be in the hallways when entering and exiting the building, and they can't be walked indoors. This means common areas such as the courtyard, main entrances, there are chairs around, and people tend to gather and chat or wait for rides etc. Community room, movie center, and game corners. Smaller community areas that are in the hallways of almost every floor's corners. Another thing that was brought up was that if any dog poop is found on the property that wasn't properly disposed of, in one of the two tiny receptacles on the south side of the building by the garages across the roadway garage driving area, the owner would be responsible for the testing fees, as well as a $500 fine. Recently, another live-in staff member told me some things that honestly shocked and kind of horrified me. The board member's actions anyways. First, one resident was walking his dog around the building, and the poop bag in his hand blew away in the wind as he was trying to get it open. He didn't want to leave it there because he was afraid of being fined over $500. 
so the only solution he could think of was to pick up the poop with his bare hand and put it in his hat to throw away inside. Second, there are two young women who are sisters who live in a two-bedroom unit. One of them has varying degrees of mobility. Some days she needs her walker, and other days she needs her scooter. She also has a service dog, a lab, which the board is aware of. Per the rules listed in the documents, service dogs are allowed in the courtyard and communal areas. One day, she took her dog into the courtyard, and he pooped in a kind of ditch-like area, which she couldn't reach from her scooter. She started to go inside to get her sister to help her, but the board member confronted her and scolded her for not picking up the poop immediately. I don't know what happened after that, but there was another day with a similar situation. She didn't go inside, however, because she was afraid of getting in trouble again. So she got onto her stomach and essentially army crawled to get to the poop, after which she couldn't get back into her scooter and couldn't call her sister for help because she was at work. Another thing that happened between them and the board member is that he allegedly knocked on their door and straight up threatened that he could get their dog taken away from them if they don't follow the rules. He also allegedly said that there's no excuse for the woman with mobility issues to not pick up her dog's poop because she can walk. ETA. The board member also told them that their dog isn't allowed in the courtyard, even though the rules explicitly state that service dogs are allowed. Everything that's happened with him has shaken them up so much that neither of them take the dog into the courtyard anymore. A different board member agreed to have a meeting with the dog owners of the building, but cancelled not even two hours prior to the meeting that was planned two weeks in advance, because something about it not looking good for her with the other board members. But don't worry because the dog owners can have a whole 30 minutes to have a chance to speak at the next public meeting in July. There's another thing that happened with the board member I've been mainly talking about that's unrelated to dogs but may add additional context. Google Fiber was recently set up in our area, so we were told that access would be needed to the CO Axe cables located in the bedroom closet, June 5th minus 7th, no start or end time specified, no estimates for what day a certain floor would be done, etc., and the email says the process will take some time to complete. We were told that we could email the board member to reschedule. I asked about the following Friday, I specifically wrote Friday the 14th, and gave options for Thursday the 13th if Friday didn't work. He responded back saying to plan on Friday around 10.30, I was out of town from the 3rd to the 7th visiting family when I got a call from my doorbell. The board member asked if I was home and wanted to enter. I said no, that I was two hours away, and he agreed to next week Friday. He said no, because he's out for two weeks after this. He ended up using the master key to enter my unit and do whatever it was to the cable. I was already angry because he went against what he agreed to but was even more pissed when I got home a day later to realize that I had left a pile of clean clothes on my bed that needed folded. My room wasn't as neat as I would have had it if I'd known someone would be there, and I hope to whatever God is out there that he didn't see a certain electronic laying on my bed, which might be the only good thing about my blanket and pillows not being laid out nice and neat. Additional details which are admittedly just speculation. Rules were added that windows can have curtains and blinds or whatever, but that outwardly facing they must appear to be white. Nothing can be between the curtains blinds etc. and the window, with the exception of holiday cling film on the inside and removable window paint. The speculation is that certain exceptions are being made for some people. Another board member's wife does window paintings for her son. Another speculation is that the board member who has been the main subject of this post has a son who absolutely hates dogs. So some people have said that the board member also hates dogs, or is making a bunch of hoops for owners to jump through, to make it easier for his son to not have to come across any dogs in a dog-friendly condominium. The rules I listed earlier are only a fraction of what's been put into place. There's also no notification when new documents are added, and no notification of any kind from anyone that new rules have been implemented. Some said get a lawyer well knock yourself out, do you have at least a $1,000 retainer? they have expensive well-connected attorneys. In New Jersey it is notoriously known for judges to side with the HOAs. Unless you have the money and connections locally, find an alternative place to live. HOAs are run by envious, rude, elitist Nazis, and it's a gold mine for them. Where I lived they put up a corral-looking fence. They said it cost $3 million. I know even with installing it, it was only $600,000. So where did the rest go? Expenses, lawyers, permits, county. 
Oh yeah, I believe that. I was on that board for eight years. I kept an on the books. I questioned and brought up elements on the books. Our HOA president was accused of coming on to a state trooper's wife. No lawsuit. But they paid them $160,000 to shut them up. Another board member had child porn on the office computer. I saw him at it one day. Someone tipped him off and his computer blue screened and he took it to be fixed and it was never seen again. They couldn't wait to get rid of me. I did have them sued by the Department of Civil Rights for me. They spent $90,000 on it and I won. I told them civil rights was my forte as a person who had become disabled from being in a coma. Anyway, one of my friends was an attorney at civil rights. I won. I got what I needed and $15,000. CR doesn't ask for much, but my days there was numbered. They became so horrendous toward me. I had to move after 27 years. I skimmed this to get some of the main points. Every dog being DNA tested, so you have a board. One member can't change rules by themselves, who apparently wants as little to do with dogs as possible. DNA testing should be the end of it though, if it's about poop because it works. What you and neighbors need to do, is start writing down narratives of what's happened to them. Also write down any accessibility issues, including distances they expect you to walk the dog to go potty, etc. Have the description of those issues ready to go for your July meeting, so the board can't claim that they weren't made aware of accessibility issues. The rule about dogs not being walked indoors, that one's not a terrible rule, honestly. You've got special needs people in your building. Some of them, and some neurotypical folks too, may not react well to dogs. Nobody can guarantee that their dog isn't aggressive. So I can understand limiting where residents may be forced to interact with dogs. Otherwise at some point a resident will argue they can't use like the movie center because they can't risk their son being around dogs something like that. One day, she took her dog into the courtyard, and he pooped in a kind of ditch-like area, which she couldn't reach from her scooter. The bard member's an asshole for watching every dog owner as if they're a criminal. But dogs do need to be on leashes, I assume. In that case, the owner can limit where the dog poops. So this seems like a preventable problem to me. The bigger issue here in my op one is the aggressive nature with which this board member is tailing people. That needs to be brought up at your July meeting. If this community is being managed like a standard homeowners association, there should be a comprehensive document known as the Covenants, Conditions and Restrictions, CCNR, that outlines the rules and regulations governing the community. This document should provide clear guidelines on how rules are added or changed, the consequences of breaking a rule, and a process for disputing any ruling on a rule violation. The CCNR should also cover other essential aspects of community management, such as architectural control, maintenance responsibilities, and dispute resolution procedures. However, if the rules and regulations are solely based on verbal agreements or unwritten understandings, it's likely that they may not be legally enforceable. In the absence of a written CCNR document, it may be challenging to establish a clear understanding of the community's rules and regulations, which can lead to confusion, disputes, and potential legal issues. To ensure that the community's rules and regulations are legally binding and enforceable, it's essential to consult with an experienced HOA lawyer who can provide guidance on the specific laws and regulations governing HOAs in your state. They can help you navigate the complexities of community management and ensure that your CCNR document is comprehensive, up-to-date, and compliant with relevant state laws. Additionally, there may be other factors at play that can impact the management of your community, such as state-specific laws and regulations, local ordinances and zoning restrictions. For instance, some states may have specific requirements for HOA governance, while others may have more relaxed regulations. It's crucial to understand these factors to ensure that your community is managed effectively and in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations. I would like to thank you for watching the video to the end. To encourage us to make more videos, please like, subscribe, comment, as well as share. Check out this other video if you haven't already.